while we're getting the slides up, I uh, would like to express my appreciation to the Ministry of Health for sponsoring us and for Green Alternative, the nice people you see running around in circles, keeping things organized here. Um, that's, that's me there. And this is what I do. So you think you know a lot about cannabis? So far this year, can you focus? Uh, did I do that? I'm sorry if I did. So far this year, we are on track to exceed 3,000 papers. Now, that comes out to about 10 papers a day. The doubling time is about seven years. So every seven years, the papers that come out doubles. That will mean that by the end of this year, there will be more than 40,000 papers if you go into PubMed and you put cannabis or cannabinoid or marijuana. And by the way, try to avoid the use of the word marijuana. It's a pejorative term invented by prohibitionists in the United States. Um, it was supposed to be uh, insulting because it was Mexican stuff. And you know you wouldn't want to be smoking that Mexican stuff, so it's called marijuana. So you'll see that all of the really knowledgeable speakers like um, Dr. Russo always carefully refers to cannabis rather than marijuana. And this is what it looks like for cancer. If you put in cannabinoid and cancer, it's a lot more manageable. Uh, it really amounts to only about uh, a couple papers a week, and you can manage that. Now, the, um, the National Cancer Institute says that there are more than 100 cancers. So, What's with that? I mean, we're talking about the National Cancer Institute in Washington, D.C., and they don't know how many cancers there are. So I thought I would find an answer for us today. And I know somebody who knows everything. So I'm going to call, and we'll find out how many cancers there are. Donald, yeah, it's Jack. Uh, how's the golf game? Oh, yeah, I know it's in the middle of the night. I'm sorry, uh, but this is really important. I'm here in uh, Macedonia. Yeah, I know you don't know where it is. You know, for a long time, the Macedonians didn't know where it is either. Yeah, don't, so don't worry about it. Anyway, this is really important. I need to know, we all need to know how many cancers there are. Is that right? Okay, well, good. Uh, so, good luck with your stupid campaign. <laughs> it, bye, Donald. Okay, so there you have it. <laughs> 113 cancers. Don't tell anybody I said that. My patients think that cannabis works for all of those cancers, however many there, there are there. Do they know something that I don't know? Well, probably they do, but in this case, they're probably not right. So you know, whenever you get your continuing medi medical education points, you have to take a quiz. So here's our quiz. Cannabinoids at appropriate doses and using appropriate methods of administration can probably cure some cancers. A, da, B, Emma, C, I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead, 
uh, I don't have a clue, and D, all of the above. Well, of course, the answer is yes, no, I don't have a clue, all of the above. Let's start with a case. This is the only well-described case in the medical literature of treatment of um, cancer with cannabis. This is a poor 14-year-old girl in Canada who had a very nice kind of cancer, acute lymphocytic leukemia, if you're going to have one. The cure rate is nearly 100%, unless you've got Philadelphia chromosome positive acute lymphocytic leukemia, and then you're really out of luck. So they did her, when they did her blast cells, they found that she had 300,000 blast cells per cubic millimeter of blood. Now the doctors know that one blast cell is abnormal. Zero blast cells is what everybody should have. Blast cells are just one step above stem cells. So she was treated with the standard protocol and predictably failed. So now we're in August of 2006 and they nuke her bone marrow and give her a bone marrow transplant. Lasted about six months and she relapsed again. They then retreated her even more aggressively, and that lasted for about eight months or so, and then she relapsed again. They aggressively treated her again, but she had headaches. So they did a CT scan, and she had infiltration of blast cells in the brain. And we're in October of 2008 now, and she's had a pretty miserable couple years. Uh, they started irradiating her brain, and I don't know if anybody's had brain irradiation. It's not a fun thing. And after um, four months, she had blast cells in the blood again, and they said, well, enough is enough. And they stopped treatment. So we're in February of 2009. This is the attending physician's note in the chart. Patient suffers from terminal malignant disease treated to the limits of available therapy. No further active intervention will be undertaken. And that was after 34 months of suffering with this uh, dreadful treatment. She was placed on home palliative care and the attending said she's probably got about two months to live max. And that's, you know, that's a pretty good uh, estimate. I think they were pretty much right on target. Par parents tend not to give up, and so they usually go to the internet, and the uh, parents found an article by Manuel Guzman, some Brazilian, I believe, um, cannabis investigator, and is still actively involved in investigation. And it was a review paper that just talked about the potential for benefit from cannabinoids in cancer. So they contacted Rick Simpson. Now that's the same t second time you've heard that name. Rick Simpson is crazy. He thinks the pineal gland is the source of the aging process and that you can reverse it with cannabis. He is a total looney tune. So if you want to get if you want to get advice on treatment of anything, don't go to Rick Simpson. So, but Rick Simpson told them how to, prepare, how to prepare hemp oil. The parents started working on that, and uh, two weeks have gone by. Her blast cell count has now risen to 194,000, heading back up to where she was in the first place. The parents got um, two ounces of chronic. Chronic is a type of cannabis that is a hybrid cross of Northern Lights. Northern Lights is, these are all actually Northern Lights Skunk AK-47. These are all kind of California strains. Northern Lights uh, is a nice strain, nice versatile strain. Skunk isn't as bad as it sounds. AK-47 isn't quite as bad as it sounds. But uh, once you've 
hybridized all these, it's kind of hard to tell what's going to come out the other end. Now, Rick told him to get isopropyl alcohol. Good Lord. So 1.2 liters of isopropyl alcohol, two ounces of chronic, which is about eight cups, so it's a, at least a quart jar of weed, put it in a double boiler and boil it down until only seven and a half mLs, mLs remain sticky, black, awful, foul-smelling stuff. The dose is poetically half of a grain of rice in size. One drop a day, and then increase to one drop three times a day. So they gave her half a grain of rice of this disgusting stuff, and of course she started vomiting. So the next day they gave her half a grain. Again, she started vomiting. Finally, on the third day, she could keep down one dose, and then very slowly she was able to build up her doses till she got to one drop three times a day. But she had terrible side effects, nausea, panic, increased appetite, euphoria, uh, hyper alert, and but this is a common thread in cancer. She was able to reduce her morphine dosage. My patients all say the same thing. Many of them stop taking opiates. Most of them can cut their opiates in half and really happens just, you know, almost predictably. On day 15, the, patient, the parents ran out of chronic. So from somewhere, they got version number two of hemp oil. So let's try to figure out how much THC was in the chronic oil. And you can do, this is just basic math. Once you become familiar with cannabis, you can kind of do this math and figure out from the products just about how much THC is there. So if the THC, if the cannabis, the chronic that they had came from the trimmings of the plant, because the growers cut off all the leaves to increase, make all the energy go into the bud and increase the size of the bud, which is where all of the cannabinoids are, then two ounces would be uh, about 57 grams. The trimmings are called shake, or about 10%, we're just making up 10%, but that's probably about right, about 570 milligrams of THC. Probably they had bud. Now the article, case report, the, the, you know, the doctors who wrote it didn't know anything about cannabis, so they didn't even say whether it was bud. Probably it was bud, which means that that oil had 5,700 milligrams of THC. Now each, um, each, uh, the 7.5 mLs has about 150 drops. Each mL has about 20 drops in it. So that means that each drop probably had about 30 to 35 milligrams of THC, and that's a lot. So after prolonged dosage tri uh, titration, she's aiming for one mL a day which is the usual dose, or eight to nine drops three times a day, she's getting about 250 milligrams of THC three times a day. So what happened? Nice thing about ALL is that you can, you got something to follow. Most of the time in, um, in, you know, in diseases, you don't have any precise indicator of just what's happening. Well, in this case, they, they could follow the blast cell count. And uh, she started out at around 228, rose while she was going through the titration. Now at the bottom, you see day zero, day three, day five, day eight, day 11, and just above it, you see the dose. Now they're aiming for one ml. On, uh, by day three, she's on 0 0.02, so she's insignificant amount, and she just can't tolerate it. De by day eight, she's gotten up a little bit. Day 11, she's up to a tenth of an ml, and by day 15, just a little bit more than a tenth of an ml, and they ran out of oil. So they got something else. Lord knows what's in it. No idea. Um, and 
you know, maybe it was good, maybe it wasn't. They slowly increased, and by day 29, by day 27, they were up to three quarters of an ml. And look what happened. She had tumor lysis syndrome, and I don't know if you remember from med school, tumor lysis syndrome is like total body gout. It happens when the tumor shrinks and disappears so quickly that you get overdosed with uric acid from all of the uh, DNA that's being torn apart in the dying cells. So this was real. Her blast cell count gradually over those couple weeks of whatever this was got down to 0.3. Now, you know, you want it to be zero, but 0.3, I'll take 0.3. Then they run out again. So they got Afghan Thai strain and they prepared their own again. And um, when they started giving it to her, it turned out to be much stronger than hemp oil too. So the blast cell count stayed about 0.5, but they had to cut back on the dose. As you can see, she's at 0.5 ml. So the doctor said, oh, let's leave that alone. She's doing pretty well there. We'll take 0.5. And then they ran out of hemp oil 3. So they got hemp oil 4. This is another outside source. No idea what was in it. The dosing at first, uh, they had to do intermittently because she got sick with it again because, you know, Lord knows, as I said, what was in it. And then as they dosed her at 0.5, her, her count st started to very slowly rise, and then at around day 60, took off. So at the end of this um, four different hemp oils, she's back up to about 79 blast cells per thousand cells. So they got hemp oil number five. Don't know what it is. And once again, her blast cell count fell and started heading towards zero. Then things really go south. The blast cell count finally did get down to zero, but probably what happened is her bone marrow died. It couldn't make normal cells, it couldn't even make blast cells. She was admitted with what was called a neutropenic colitis and with bowel perforation, GI bleeding, and the parents said, you know, enough. DNR, and a few hours later, she died. So what kind of conclusions can we draw from this? This is a really instructive case for people who, and this is most people, who try to wing it, uh, because th there isn't, you know, there aren't a lot of knowledgeable people around who can guide you through this. Uh, it was a nightmare, but, you know, as, as I've said, they, I have no idea. The, the poor Canadian oncologists, they didn't know what was in this cannabis. Um, the dosing was entirely empirical. I mean, Rick Simpson doesn't know what he's doing, but obviously he was on to something. I mean, something happened there. The side effects were terrible. Um, the dose response to the blast cell count seemed to be there. As they got up in the dose, it seemed to work. I mean, something happened at a certain critical level with one of these oils. The story commonly comes back that you can suppress cancer, but cannabis alone is unlikely to cure it, and that was certainly the case here, that cannabis had a big clinical effect, but it did not cure the cancer. She survived three miserable months now, the doctors predicted two months, so that's not exactly a great victory. She, she got a month of misery out of it. What bothers me most about the case is this is terrible medical care. This is awful. She should, you know, especially when it was clear where this was going, and that was way before they said palliative care, she should have gotten good palliative care, and at the end, she was supposed to be getting palliative care, and instead she was being made miserable by the hemp oil. But what if they actually knew what they were doing? 
I mean, something happened there, yeah? I mean, I, I don't, no, argue, no matter how skeptical you are, and believe me, I'm skeptical, something happened. And what if they used just CBD or a THC CBD oil, because what they were probably using is pure, T, almost certainly, pure THC oil, and they started it early with the chemotherapy. Would the whole outcome have been different? We don't know. But I, th you know, I think it's reasonable to at least ask the question, would this outcome have been different? So we're going to look at two areas. One is what we were talking about with her, with attacking the disease. The second, no question about, as Dr. Russo mentioned, symptom relief of cancer symptoms and chemotherapy symptoms, no question. Absolutely good evidence-based medicine that cannabis helps. Relieves pain, it relieves nausea, it relieves, it prevents the chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, it stimulates appetite and may result in weight gain, and it helps with secondary symptoms of anxiety, insomnia, depression. Uh, getting a diagnosis of cancer is like PTSD. Uh, and it's common when I see patients with PTSD, you know, I see a 35-year-old and I say, why do you have PTSD? Well, it's probably not because they were in Vietnam. Uh, usually the, you know, the answer is something like a terrible auto accident, my best friend died, or I got a cancer diagnosis. The treatment of symptoms, cancer symptoms with cannabinoids is actually pretty easy. Dr. Russo told you how. Start low dose, titrate up, and aim at symptom relief. Don't go too fast. Get up to the dose where you relieve symptoms. Sometimes you can then back off. And uh, sometimes after a week or two, you have to increase it a bit more. But you don't get in the opioid cycle where you just increase, increase, increase. You, you know, you hit a certain level and it stays there and maybe goes up a little bit, but that's it. The other problem we have is almost all of the data in the literature on uh, cancer is with THC. There's some Sativex data, not a lot. And I think Sativex is problematic in cancer because Sativex is one-to-one -one THC to CBD. That is not enough CBD. So Sativex is, you know, is the wrong proportions, and I think the Sativex folks would acknowledge that. Why does cannabis work for cancer pain? Uh, the pain relief is mediated through the CB1 receptors, you've heard that today, which are really concentrated in the brain and the spinal cord uh, and the peripheral nervous system. But you know, organs all over the body do have CB1 receptors, it's just that they're really densely concentrated in the brain so that they're kind of where pain gets out of control. And as Dr. Russo said, they modulate. So when you get in these pain cycles where the nerves are just you know, firing because pain's there, the cannabinoid system slows it down and tries to bring it under control. Animal models of tumor pain show that THC has efficacy that's similar to the opiates and that cannabinoids will prevent chemotherapy neuropathy from occurring in animal models. What about humans? When they uh, measured pain relief with THC, it's equal to uh, 10 milligrams, you know, not, you know, little high dose for some people, but not really. 60 milligrams of codeine, if you get up to 20 milligrams, which is fairly high, 120 milligrams of codeine. The THC CBD studies are not consistent, they're mixed. But what they say is about a third of the patients get some relief that's sustained for about a year. Only two points on, you know, the visual analog scale, you know, at, where you're at one if you're, you know, just stop asking me a question and give me some medication, doctor. Or you're up, I mean, up at 11 or you're down at zero, which is, you know, you're feeling good. Only two points on the scale, not dramatic. 
Nabilone, which is a THC-like synthetic analog, but it's very similar to THC, also was shown to decrease pain, nausea, anxiety, and allowed a reduction in doses of other medication. There was possible synergism with opiates demonstrated in this study, and believe me, it's there, uh, so that reduction in opiates is routinely seen. And there were two randomized clinical trials that showed that pain from peripheral neuropathy is improved with vaporized or smoked cannabis. Nausea and vomiting. The emetic circuit is controlled by endocannabinoids. CB1 receptors and 5-HT receptors. Now, nausea and vomiting are two different things. The, neuro the uh, oncologists know that very well. Nausea is a neurological kind of experience. Vomiting is a motor experience. So nausea often leads to vomiting, but they're two totally different things neurologically. Now, the animal models don't help us much because rats don't vomit. And that's why you use rat poisoning, because they can't vomit it up. Shrews, I mean, see, you're learning a lot of stuff today. Shrews can vomit. So the animal models are with shrews. Human studies, overall, the effectiveness is said to be about 30%. I think it's probably better than that, but that's what the literature said. THC or nabilone, basically THC stuff, was effective in clinical trials and shown by meta-analyses and systematic reviews to be better than compazine, um, metoclopramide, chlorpromazine, thorazine, haloperidol, haldol, or dromperidone. But not as effective as ondansetron, which is usually the go-to drug. It's still, it's better than cannabis. And um, a new one, epreptant, which I really don't know anything about. But other drugs, the cancer patients will tell you, yeah, okay, I take ondansetron, it relieves my nausea. Everything else is there. You know, the pain's there, the depression's there, the insomnia is there. What you will hear over and over is what's unique about cannabis is pleiotropy. Pleiotropy means one thing gets many results, and it's the remarkable thing about this incredible drug. So that you can relieve the nausea, and you can relieve the pain, and you can sleep, and you're less anxious, maybe less depressed. With THC CBD, there's only one small pilot placebo randomized clinical trial, but it was effective for nausea, and smoke cannabis is probably as effective as THC or nabilone. How about appetite? Not quite, you know, the appetite things, uh, THC is not great, especially great for appetite. Now, everybody tells you when they smoke, a joint, the, you know, they get the munchies. Some of that, I think, is because they expect to get the munchies. Um, but there is no question that some of the varieties, usually the stimulating varieties of cannabis, do, do increase appetite. And um, in mice, they have shown that THC does enhance appetite. Now, there are some control studies from the bad old HIV days when cannabis first got legitimized in California. Uh, Megase was said to be more effective than THC, and I don't believe that. I think Megase is mostly garbage. But, you know, it, because of this trial, the, the Pharmacy companies all make you try Megase before you can use any of the cannabinoids. There are no published studies with cannabis and cancer, but there are lots of studies that go back that show that for a certain percentage of patients, it's an appetite stimulant. And the way patients use it is to affect, not, not to get high, but to the effect on appetite. So what they all tell me is it's lunchtime and they don't feel like eating because, you know, some people just, you know, if they're either sick or some people just don't eat. And so they'll take a hit on the, on the joint 
and wait about 15 minutes and they'll get their appetite and then they'll have lunch. You know, it's not been studied like that, but that's what, now I don't know how many patients it doesn't work for. So the, the point stands that it's not very well studied, but it certainly does work for some patients. The endocannabinoid system is central to the regulation of mood and extinction of bad memories. Remember this. Cannabis is the most effective drug for PTSD. In fact, it's the only one that works. All the other PTSD drugs are garbage. They make you feel worse, and they don't do anything for the PTSD. They just kind of shut you up, and you don't bother the doctor anymore. THC and CBD are anxiolytic in rats. Not really known, you know, how. You can tell when rats are anxious, I guess. But it, does, it, does, they, it isn't really known how it works in rats. Human studies, there's some sm small studies in cancer patients that show improved relaxation and sleep with THC. There's some case studies that show improved mood, but really not much data there. So if you want if you don't believe me, cool. Um, you want to see the data for yourself. That's where I am. That's what I learned in med school. Prove it to me. And if I'm not sure you're right, I'm going to go find out myself. You can put in, you can Google in the poor National Cancer Institute of, National Can uh, Cancer Institute that I've been kind of hard on. If you put NCI, cannabis, and cancer, what will pop up is the, what's called the PDQ. That is excellent. It was just updated about two months ago. Um, and it covers all of this with all of the references. And it's really quite readable for a medical document anyway. OK, that's symptoms. No question. Easy. It's all there. Documentation's there. Studies are there. It's not the best studies in the world, but they're entirely believable, and experience replicates what the studies tell us. What does it do to cancers? Now, we had an example there of something that just shocked me when I read it. And obviously, the, the oncologists taking care of the girl were shocked as well. There is a huge amount of data. I don't recommend going to it. It'll, I mean, it's good for sleep. Uh, it's, but it's a huge, that's a joke. It's a huge amount of data on cell line studies that show that cannabinoids promote tumor cell death, apoptosis. They inhibit proliferation. They inhibit invasion. They reduce metastasis. They inhibit growth of blood vessels to the tumors. Now, this is like the definition of cancer. It is pleiotropy writ big, it does all of, these, all of these different things that should, in the long run, control cancer. The problem is it's cell line research, and it's not trustworthy. Uh, cell line research is a single cancer cell that's stimulated to grow into a cell line, and then you try out different drugs with it. Now, that's useful in looking at whether you've got drugs that you ought to study now in animals, but it's not very useful in predicting clinical response. What the cell line research shows that stops everybody in their tracks is that THC can make cancer cells, cells, cell line, can make cancer cells grow faster. And it's a dose response except it's a dose response in both directions. Some cancer cells, lower doses, cause growth, and higher doses kills the tumor cells. Other cancers, it's the other way around, which scares you. You don't know what dose to use if this is accurate. And there are some animal studies that, and I'll, that I'll come to that kind of support that. Now, this is my favorite kind of, isn't that pretty? my favorite kind of uh, thing to encounter in a journal article, because it saves a lot of time. You know, you're reading through your journal, and you see this, and you go, wow, flip, turn the page. Nobody looks at these, actually pays any attention to these things. But you can see the, 
the receptors up there. There's CB1, CB2, TRPV1, you haven't heard much about that, GPR55, and there are other receptors. And they do all kinds of stuff in between there. But what's cool is down here, pow, 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 dead cells. Love it, apoptosis. Now, in the animal models, there's some support for efficacy of THC, CBD, Delta-8 that started with a study 40 years ago of implanting lung cancers in rats, in mice, I'm sorry, mice. And they reduced tumor size. CBD didn't do anything. Now, that was a long time ago. You know, may not be as reliable as the cannabinoids that we have now. The strongest evidence of, this, of uh, benefit is seen in a fairly reliable animal model, which always kind of bothers me because it just seem weird, seems weird. They take a breast cancer cell line and inject it in a mouse foot pad, and it grows breast cancer in the mouse foot pad. Now, I mean, that doesn't sound like a good animal model to me, but you know, it is, it is fairly reliable. And it shows that THC, CBD, does and is indeed tumoricidal. It does shrink tumors, but you see resistance emerge afterwards. You also see evidence of synergy among the cannabinoids as, and the terpenoids, as Dr. Uh, Russo was talking about. There is also good evidence of synergy of cannabinoids in malignant in gliomas glioblastomas in mouse models. The colon cancer studies are the ones that, that give you heartburn because the studies show that cannabinoids can increase growth of cancer, colon cancer in mouse studies, or it can decrease. It also shows the entourage effect that, that has been mentioned a few times. And there's some limited support in animal models for hepatic, bone, skin, lymphoma, leukemia, pancreatic, gastric, thyroid, uterine, cervical, neuroblastoma, oral, head and neck cancers. Now, it's, it, you know, I went through that fairly quickly because there's not a lot of data there. Uh, a lot of people with those cancers cite, you know, like especially prostate. You see lots of stuff how it's effective for prostate, but the data is not very good. It's just not there. And something happens on the internet. I don't, I don't know if anybody here is a fan of Gary Larson. Um, this is one of Gary Larson's best cartoons ever. This is the Ginger cartoon. This is what we say to dogs. Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. You understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. Now, here's what Ginger hears. Blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 blah. So this is kind of like the internet. Press release, a study of papillary breast cancer in mouse foot pads show that after one week of treatment with cannabis, some mice experienced a 10% tumor shrinkage. So the bloggers pick it up. What the bloggers said was a study of blah, breast cancer, blah, blah, showed that blah, 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 treatment with cannabis, blah, blah, experienced tumor shrinkage. So, and then the patients go see their doctor, and the doctor goes, oh my God, not again. Okay, here is, you're going to see the entire world literature on cannabis and cancer. There's the case report I gave you, which is, you know, they're really the only in-depth case report in 2006, in Brazil, there were nine patients who failed treatment for their glioblastomas. And they didn't have a lot to lose. So the uh, researcher went in and dug out a little bit of the, drilled a hole, dug out a little bit of the glioblastoma, put a catheter in there, and injected THC in. Now, he was not, a, I don't think, a very good researcher because he didn't have a protocol. The nine patients had, diff you know, they all had glioblastomas, but, it, you know, one glioblastoma can be quite different from others. It's a very small study. And the doses were all over the place. And how do you equate 
micrograms injected into a tumor with taking cannabis. And there's a study that, there was a commentary that came along after this that tried to figure out what kind of dose you're actually talking about and said, you know, you can't get those kind of doses. So this is crazy. Well, the paper turned out probably not to be right because the CB studies, CD, CBD studies showed that you really can get up to the kind of doses that actually got in the tumors. Three of the patients seemed to respond, and then one of them died. Two of the three lived a year, almost a year. But, you know, it's a bad study. You can't, and it was never repeated, and I have no idea why. Uh, probably because it was a bad study. Um, and it's just not possible to tell whether cannabis actually worked. And then there's another case report of two girls who are 11 years old and 13 year olds, years old with a really bad brain cancer and astrocytoma. And they, even if you cut them out, they come, they come back and they couldn't cut them out. You know, sometimes it's in an area of the brain, you just can't cut it out completely. Both of the tumors, when they were given THC or high quality potent cannabis read lots of THC, the tumors shrank, one disappeared. The other one nearly disappeared by good quality MRIs. And then there are two clinical trials registered with the federal government in the US that are closed. One was a Sativex trial, and I'm sure it was negative because Sativex will publish anything to get in the literature if it was positive, and it was not, I'm, so I'm pretty sure it was not positive. The other one was shut down, and I think it's because they couldn't get cases enrolled. So if you want to join an active clinical trial, there aren't any. Nothing is being studied in a legitimate clinical trial at this point, and if it's not published and not subject to peer review, don't believe it. That's just the way it is. Okay, I'm gonna give you a special treat because I'm standing between you and lunch. Let's have some short conclusions and then the special treat. Okay, there is no reliable evidence to support the use of cannabinoids as sole treatment for any cancer and I will stand behind that and there are a lot of people who will disagree with, with me and say, oh, you know, my aunt had cancer of the nose and she smoked a joint three times a day and it all went away. Yeah, well, you know, I'm very happy for your aunt, but I don't believe you. Cannabinoids may shrink tumors, but there is no good evidence that they cure cancers. Now they may, it just may be that we don't have the evidence, but I think it's fairly clear to say right now that we don't, we really can't assume that cannabinoids alone are gonna cure a cancer, except skin cancers. And I think that it, they work for skin cancers, and there's plenty of anecdotal stuff that's quite believable, but otherwise not believable. That much hope and attention has been focused on CBD, but most of the data, the animal data, the cell line studies, most of the stuff we've been talking about is THC or THC CBD. Now we go into the realm of belief right now, and I believe that CBD needs THC. That taking CBD alone for pretty much anything, you're not getting the complete bang for your buck, that you need some THC in there. And I'll give you a good example of how you can get in trouble when you say things to patients and they're ginger and they don't entirely hear what you say. So conceptually, the idea of THC, CBD, treating symptoms, which is, you know, no question about it, plus conventional chemotherapy, that the cannabinoids may very well help. I believe it. If I had a cancer and I had to take chemotherapy, I would take cannabinoids with my chemotherapy because I believe that it will make a difference. And uh, Dr. Russo talked about P450 activation, and that's a real concern in chemotherapy because the P450 pathway is how they get metabolized, how the, uh, the cancer drugs get metabolized. But it appears not to be an issue. Um, that, you know, it's, it's mostly something we worry about, but it doesn't actually happen. 
So when, when can you be comfortable using cannabinoids? Symptom control, I think, you know, if you're with me here, no, no argument about that. No other treatment is available or possible, like the poor girl with ALL. You know, that's, the asterisk means, why not? You know, I've got nothing else to do, let's try that. Or the prognosis is terrible, despite the very best treatment we can give it, why not? Or as adjunctive treatment, as I described, when the response is usually suboptimal. Now, if the response to chemotherapy is 100%, don't be stupid and tempt fate. You know, you can't get better than 100%, so stick with 100%. You, you know, you're probably not going to hurt it with uh, cannabinoids by adding to it, but don't get carried away because, you know, I'm still kind of worried about that the THC mouse studies and cell line studies that of the possibility of stimulating tumor growth. So make sure that when you use it, it's something that you actually need or it's part of a legitimate clinical trial of which there are none. Or somebody really smart like me, a guru, unfortunately, us gurus are prone to make the same mistake over and over and we call it experience. So be careful about who you're getting advice from. Okay, let's sli skip in favor of lunch, and here's your treat. This is one week old. I spoke with the mother one week ago. So her son, who unfortunately lives in Texas, I'll leave it at that. There is, Oklahoma's worse. I, I'm from Oklahoma. But, um, had, her son had several months of headaches, went to get, and went to the doctor. The uh, doctor did an MRI, and he had a huge unresectable glioblastoma that involved the thalamus and couldn't be resected because it, you know, is in, it's involving the basal ganglia. You can't do it. He wouldn't survive the surgery. The oncologist said, you know, there's no hope, but yeah, you know, on, as oncologists will, we'll irradiate him and get him some chemotherapy anyway, even if it's not going to work. Okay. Mother is a nurse, very determined, smart. She flies to California where she has some friends who grow weed, and she comes to see me. And we talked for a long time, because in California you have to get a card. The card says you have a legitimate medical problem, and with that card you can go into a dispensary and buy all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with medicine, that you know makes you feel good, but also can have to do with medicine. So we talked a long time, and I said, you know, as I read the literature, as I read these studies in, uh, in the glioblastomas, you need, whatever you're going to use, you need very high doses. And I said, but there's really not good supporting data, but that seems to be the right answer. And she said, what's a high dose? And never believing she'd actually do what I said, I said, yeah, a gram a day, CBD. That's a lot of CBD. It's a huge 1,000 milligrams a day of CBD. Now, you can't, probably can't afford that, but her friends grew. I also told her, as I told you, THC is essential. Now, what she took away from that, blah, blah, ginger, is equal amounts of THC and CBD. So, 1,000 milligrams of THC a day, a day and 1,000 milligrams of CBD a day. Now. That must have been hard to take, but this woman was tough, and I don't think she uh, let her son say no. I don't think she even asked him. So her friends prepared a one-to-one -one oil and gave her a fee free supply, usually minimum. It's a 500 to to $1,000 a month. They went, and I said, you have to go to your oncologist. You can't do this alone because there may be an effect on the metabolism of the chemotherapy. So they went to the Texas neuro-oncologist and said, you know, I saw this crazy doctor in California, and he said to give 
huge doses of CBD and THC. And the oncologist said, oh, whatever. Um, that, you know, I don't care, because I can't do anything anyway. So they titrated the dose up, as I said, slowly, and he, uh, he's tolerated it. I mean, I've never heard of somebody tolerating that much THC, but he tolerated. And he put the oil under his tongue three times a day, or if he couldn't tolerate the taste, because it's pretty foul, he would soak a Cheerio and put the Cheerio under his tongue and let it get absorbed. So they went back to the neuro-oncologist for their follow-up at one gram, I mean at one, um, at four months, and the neuro-oncologist did an MRI and he said, what have you been doing? I, I'm not making this up, and I'll show you I'm not making it up. After a year, the glioblastoma was gone. Okay, here are the MRIs. Over here, that's, that's the cancer. Just terrible. Huge, huge glioblastoma right where the action is there. This is the four month follow up. It's a big hole. Maybe some residual tumor, but where did it go? You know, that's, there's, that's not the tumor. This is the year follow-up. Those are vascular markings. It's gone. There's a collapse, a shrinkage of the, the tissue around there so that the, the uh, opening, the lacuna, is the uh, um, anterior horn. I think I've forgotten my neuroanatomy. Anyway, it's, it's bigger. This is follow-up about, uh, I think, about a year and a half later. Gone. So his dose has been reduced down to 400 milligrams a day. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the long run. But, and, you know, as I said, the data's not good, but, boy, something's going on. And I think it's, that something is something that we've really got to figure out. If you want to get started, now you've heard, you're really confused, I know, because there's so much coming at you, and I would be overwhelmed too. A good basic place to start is a cheap book here, and it's a really good basic book, Medical Marijuana 101. You can get it on Amazon. You can download it to your Kindle for $10, or you can buy it on Amazon for $15 is what I paid for it. After you read that, read it again. I did. I read, I'm smart, but I've read it twice because there's stuff I got out of it the second time that I just didn't get the first time. If you want to move up to the very best book there is, Michael Backus's book. Whoops, oh, God, sorry. Okay. Anyway, Michael Backus's book, Cannabis Pharmacy, is a lot costlier. You can also get that on... Um, on a, uh, a download for Kindle or from Amazon. Just full disclosure, I'm the medical editor for the second edition, which will be out shortly. I just reread, I mean literally reread, on the plane coming here, just reread the book. It's an amazing book. It has a totally different look at how we should use cannabinoids that is completely in line with what Dr. Russo is talking about, and I believe, and it is, really an educational book for everyone, but it's got to be read a couple times, a lot of information there. 